This is part two in the series about neuromuscular disorders, and this one will address muscular dystrophy. There are about five or six types of muscular dystrophy, and the most common form is the Duchenne type. It's also known as the pseudohypertrophic dystrophy, and it is the most common worldwide, affecting one in 35,000 males. Symptoms tend to begin in their early childhood, about the age of three, where they learned how to walk when they were one. They walked and ran and jumped and kicked and climbed until about age three, and then the parents start noticing that the child is having some weakness and difficulty getting up. In general, they can live into their 20s and 30s, and the most frequent cause of death is from cardiopulmonary complications, primarily a pneumonia. So the Duchenne type, actually all the types are X-linked, but the Duchenne type is X-linked recessive, so females are carriers and the males are affected. And you can see how the Mendelian split of how the mom is the carrier, dad isn't affected, one child that's male is completely unaffected, another daughter is not affected, one daughter becomes a carrier for the next generation, and then one son is affected by the gene. The defective gene is on the X chromosome, as already said, and what it does is it makes the protein dystrophin unavailable for use. And the purpose of dystrophin is to keep muscles strong. It provides support within the muscle cell itself, and without it, what happens is the cell membrane becomes permeable to other things to enter, and it completely destroys the cell. In addition, because of the muscle destruction, there is an inflammatory response and immune response, and that leads to further damage of the muscle tissue. Eventually, there is atrophy of the muscle tissue, degeneration of the voluntary muscles with the gradual onset of the symptoms. So the voluntary muscles are all those that you can say, I'm going to squeeze your hand and you try and do it. But with muscular dystrophy, your brain is saying to do it, but your muscles in your hand are saying, nope, I don't have enough strength to, to be able to do it. Over time, the muscle tissue is replaced with fat deposits and connective tissue, and what we see is a symmetric muscle wasting. They become deformed and eventually have profound disability. The diagnostics include a full physical assessment, and so this is where that musculoskeletal assessment is very important, comparing side to side, uppers and lowers, to see the strength the ability to move voluntarily. The lab includes the CPK because they're muscle wasting, so the CPK is released and it's going to be very high levels. These kids are sent for a muscle biopsy, and what they're going to find is less muscle tissue and more fat tissue and connective tissue. And then the last test is the EMG, where they literally stick the muscle with needles, and they can feel the needles, but when they ask them to contract, they're not able to, and then uh, when they give a little jolt to the muscle, we're not seeing the response, and the response should be contraction of that muscle. So the type of assessment findings will depend on the type that they have. Another form, Becker's muscular dystrophy, has similar muscle wasting, but it occurs later in the child's life. It's still in childhood, and it's a much slower progression of the muscle weakness and wasting. But eventually, they all have a decrease in strength. Many of them end up being obese. There's nothing wrong with their appetite, and they are fed by others at some point, and they're not doing anything to warrant all of the calories. They're still growing their skeletal bones. It's just their muscles that are lacking. There can be a decrease in the IQ. It is not that common. So the classic things that we can see when a kid has muscular dystrophy is they walk with this waddling, wide-based gait. I have a picture on the next slide where you can see how they have to put their feet apart in order, order to be stable. They have what we call the Gower sign. They have to go forward on their hands, put them on their knees, and then be able to raise up their trunk. They have a lot of difficulty climbing steps because they can't get the muscles to raise the leg because really the leg is very heavy. They have weak hypertrophied calf muscles. They develop contractures of their knees and their hips because they're not being utilized to the extent that they should be. Their feet end up being deformed because of lack of use. 
and then they end up with a scoliosis. Remember, this is starting at age three, and it gets worse and worse and worse as they get older. They're now in a wheelchair, and they end up having scoliosis because they do not have the muscle support along the spine. They can also have a lordosis. Most of these kids are going to lose the ability to walk completely by the time they are an early teen. And by the end of adolescence, they're completely dependent on others. The only thing they can do on their own is breathe. And that's what we worry about next, is that they're going to lose the ability to breathe. Here is the picture of what the Gower sign looks like. So they're sitting on the floor. They have to get onto their knees. Then they push their, their pelvis up into the the air with their hands on the ground and then they move their hands up to their knees and their thighs and push themselves so that they're going up and they can stand. And here's a real child who's demonstrating how he has to get up and move. And you can see the muscle wasting. When you look at his head, you would expect that his muscles would be much greater or much bigger than what they show. Muscular dystrophy is a multidisciplinary approach to management. We have to get all of our clinical partners in place from dietary, occupational therapy, physical therapy, neurology, nursing, medicine. So we need adaptive devices to help them to walk and to help them to move. We also want to put these kids in braces to minimize the contractures because those are going to come on very quickly. We need to promote self-care as much and as long as possible. For the children who develop scoliosis, they'll go to the OR and they will have Harrington rods placed and you'll learn more about that in musculoskeletal next week. They can get a motorized wheelchair, they're expensive, but if they qualify for it and there is somebody to pay for it, this allows them to be a little bit more independent and they can use it as long as they have some type of an apparatus that they can propel it forward. So we'll use positioning devices, especially when they're in the hospital, because we're going to be turning them. And remember, these kids are going to be big by the time you get them. We don't see them too much when they're uh, three, four, five, and six. We're going to see these kids when they're in their mid to late teens. And then you'll see them as they get older into their 20s. Make sure that you turn your patient at least every two hours to reduce the incidence of skin ulcers. They have respiratory problems because of the lack of respiratory muscle support. They cannot expand their lungs as deep as they need to, so they're at high risk for developing a pneumonia. They may end up having to be trached because they are not able to breathe on their own, and then they'll be on a ventilator. And they possibly can be sprinted during the day where they can breathe enough on their own while they're awake, but they need a ventilator whenever they take a nap or during the night. So frequently assess their airway, turn them every two hours, keep the head of the bed elevated. You can turn them onto their side, make sure their side rails are up because they cannot catch themselves if, if they fall. They don't have the muscles. Have suction and oxygen available and, of course, your emergency equipment. For the children who are not able to feed themselves once they lose the control of their upper extremities, then we're going to put in either an NG tube or a G tube. And this may not happen until they're about 17 or 18 years old. They try and maintain as much as they can, even if it means that we're going to feed them. If the child is admitted, we'll get Child Life involved and the Make-A-Wish Foundation because these children are going to die in their early to mid-20s. And so if there's something they really want to do, let's make that happen. Get them out of their room and out to the playroom as much as possible so they can actually enjoy life. And these kids can go to school. There's nothing wrong with their brains. They can go to school, but what will end up happening is they start out walking to school, then they start out with a walker, and then they're in a wheelchair, and then they're in a very fancy wheelchair with a ventilator, and a nurse is going to school with them to take care of that ventilator. The families need a lot of support when they get this diagnosis initially. They're on stun, but they quit learn how to take care of their children. So ask them what are the routines, allow them to take breaks so that they can go shower and they can eat or they can go home or they can just have a little bit of rest because when we don't have them in the hospital, somebody's taking care of this child at home 24-7, 365. Case managers and social services as well as psychological support persons are also a part of our multidisciplinary team, so make sure you get them involved. As far as medical management goes, we don't really have much to offer these kids. We can give them 
steroids to reduce the immune response and the inflammatory response. But you know that steroids have a lot of side effects, so we have to balance that. There are a lot of things coming down the pike. None of them are medication, but they're trying gene therapy. But as much research as has been done on for muscular dystrophy, we're really not any more advanced than we were 30, 40, 50 years ago. So this ends the lecture on muscular dystrophy. Thank you.